Father, it's a joy and an honor to be in your house tonight, God. So good. We're, we're just excited. Lord, we're refreshed in your presence, God. And Lord, we know that tonight that you're going to do something amazing in our midst. And so we praise you, God. We thank you, Lord, for your presence in this house, God. God, we ask that as we open up your word tonight, God, that you open it up to us. Open us up to receive it, Father. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. Truly tonight, God, we didn't come to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old, from the black, the white, the brown, any other color we could imagine, God. None of that matters, God. We don't want to hear from the ideas and the philosophies of man. We want to hear from you, God. So tonight, we acknowledge that the Holy Spirit is the teacher of the church. Welcome in this place, Holy Spirit. Be our teacher. Be our guide. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the instruction, the direction, even the correction we need for our lives. And Lord, we'll praise you and thank you for it. Heal us, Holy Spirit. Teach us. Lead us. Uh, give us your vision, God. Lord, just come and bless us with your word. May it be the seed planted in good ground, and may it produce a harvest to the glory of God. Lord, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet, that are both preaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, at no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. So God, we ask that you would bless them as you bless us this day, and Lord, we praise you and thank you that you're growing your church worldwide, God, and especially, God, we do remember our persecuted brothers and sisters scattered abroad. We ask that you comfort them, strengthen them, protect them, God, may they endure to the end, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, and we say, amen. Amen. Tonight, get your Bibles out. We've been, uh, when I've been in the pulpit on Wednesday nights, I've been doing a little uh, series that I'm calling Distractions from Destiny. Okay, now before, let's take that title down, guys, in the video department. I should have warned them, okay, so take that down because I don't want to jump to the punch just yet. But I've been doing this, this little series, and the first time we were together, we talked about sin. And then last time, we talked about people. Too much to review right now, so all the messages are free online. You can get a hold of those, or they do have the CDs over there uh, that you can grab if you want to catch up. But don't worry, tonight's message stands on its own, and you'll be able to catch up right where we're at. Now, to kind of segue into the message tonight, I just want to tell you how I got to church this morning. Is that okay? This morning I got up and I was uh, getting dressed, getting ready and everything, and and seeing that it was a holiday, my kids didn't have school, and so they're running around in their jammies, and I'm making them waffles and all that fun stuff, you know, we're having a good time in the house. Now, my mom was coming over uh, to watch the kids. Many of you guys know my mom. She's wonderful, and uh, Grammy just loves her grandkids, and so Grammy was coming over for a Grammy day with her her, uh, grandchildren and was just going to have a good time, so she shows up, you know, and and, uh, my wife and I were getting ready, and and, uh, you know, Monday and Tuesday. Tuesday, we, had our, we have our days off, and so during that time, we had been doing work around the house, we'd been doing some upkeep and maintenance stuff, uh, you know, upgrading different things, gardening, you know, and, and, and then one of the things that we did on our days off, because the season's starting to change, starting to get cold. I mean, we have not seen cold in California for quite some time, is that right? So, you know, we were kind of going through some of the bins, trying to dust off the sweaters and all that kind of stuff, and, and uh, you know, we went clothes shopping about the kids' warm jammies and all that kind of stuff, so we're going through closets. And as we're going through them, we had all these bags of stuff. And so we're saying, you know what, let's get rid of it. It's old. We don't need it. Or, or we just haven't wore it. You know, you haven't touched that in a year, honey. It's time to throw that. That's what my wife says to me, not me to her. She says, honey, you have not wore that shirt in over a year. Get rid of it, you know. And, and so... Uh, we're getting rid of stuff, and, and so this morning, here's my mom, you know, here I'm getting dressed, all that kind of stuff, and then as I'm trying to leave, my wife is like, honey, you need to get the bags out, you know, we, we're going to go donate those clothes, and it's like, ah, okay, fine, you know, so getting the bags out, all that kind of stuff, and then trying to leave again, and it's like, oh, wait, computer, okay, wait, i uh, got to get this, got to get that, you know, and getting everything ready, and so finally, um, I'm getting ready to leave, and, and my wife is telling me, honey, wait for me, wait for me. I'm going, what am I wait for you for? You know, we got two cars. You can drive yourself. You're a big girl, you know. And so I finally was like, I'm out. I'm gone. I'm going to work. I need to study. I need to get ready. And so I I head out the door, and I I start to drive, and I get on the freeway. And as I'm getting on the freeway, all of a sudden, the phone starts ringing. And so I, I connect in, and I'm like, hello. You know, it's my wife. She says, honey, you need to turn around and come back. I'm like, why am I going to turn around and come back? What is going on? And she says, I have a flat tire. Now, wouldn't you know, I'm in, I'm in my, my, my church clothes, right? I'm going to preach tonight, so I've got to be in front of people. And I'm, all I can think about is, you know, tan and black, even though they go together like this. 
when they go together like this, that doesn't work, right? So here I am going, man, I'm, I'm, I'm rushing. I'm, where are you? you know, so I got to find out where she's at. She hadn't got too far from the house. And so I'm, I'm thinking, should I go home and, and get jeans or what should I do? It's just a tire to change. So I get out there, I change the tire, you know, and, and I'm literally doing what every, uh, probably every physician, every doctor, every, uh, you know, good, good weightlifting trainer, coach type person would tell you not to do, which is you, you lift where, you know, I'm lifting the tire up so that I don't touch my pants and all the pressure's going on my lower back, you know. I'm, so I'm doing that number, trying to get the tire and, 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 and doing all this kind of stuff. And finally, I get the tire on, get everything done. You know, I'm wiping my hands off with baby wipes that we just happen to have in the car. And, uh, and thank God for that kind of randomness that parents have in the car. You know, we don't even have kids with diapers anymore, but we got baby wipes. So, you know, I'm just wiping my hands off, all that kind of stuff. Go down the, the, the tire store and, and get a new tire. And finally, by the time we're all done with everything, it's like 1130. I said, honey, let's just go to lunch. And so we went and we had a, a, a wonderful little lunch together and, and just ate. And, and my wife looked at me and she says, you know what? We're not going to let this stuff ruin our day. Can't let a little flat tire and a little, you know, detour take away our joy. And, you know, I looked at her and I said, you are absolutely right. See, there's things in life that will distract us, try and get us off. But if you recognize and realize that delays and detours are not to get you off track with your destiny. See, I was trying to get here, and, and I got here. I got here clean, too. Don't you guys like, you know, the fact that there's a little bit of something there? But anyways, we're good, right? But those distractions and those detours, if you allow them to, can take you off of where you need to be going. They can get you off of the right track. See, even when I, I had finished changing the tire, I started coming down Redlands Boulevard. And wouldn't you know, they're doing some sort of construction on the street. I had to go all the way around and find another route. But see, it's no different in life. The devil's going to throw things at your way. Life is going to happen. Sometimes people blame the devil for everything. And the devil is going, what did I do? I didn't even do that, but I'll take credit for it, you know. Kind of like those terrorist organizations. Yeah, we blew up the plane. No, you didn't. It malfunctioned, you know, but, but they'll take credit for it. But see, we blame the devil for a lot of stuff, and it may not even be the devil. It might just be that life is happening. And all that should do is it should throw us to and make us cling to the Lord rather to, than to ourselves and our own wisdom. Now, the distraction that I want to talk about tonight, we talked about sin, we've talked about people. I want to talk about a very important one because all of us at every level, doesn't matter your age, doesn't matter your background, doesn't matter your social or your economic status. This is not exclusive to a certain group of people because all people will deal with this, okay? And I'll show that to you in the Word. And that is things. Things can be a distraction from destiny. In fact, I'm going to make this statement, and I'm going to put it up on the overheads for you. Covetousness, greed, and desire for things can derail your destiny if you let it. That's pretty serious when you think about it. Wait a second, Pastor Dan, hold on. You're telling me that things can get me off of my destiny? Absolutely. We'll see that in the Word tonight. Covetousness, greed, and desire for things can derail your destiny if you let it. Now, I've got three words up there. Covetousness, greed, and desire. All of these come down to a simple term called intense desires, if you will. Uh, first time you see covetousness in the Bible, actually, it's not translated covetous. It's translated pleasurable to the eye in the book of Genesis, talking about all the trees of the garden that God had made. He says that they are pleasurable to the eye. Then it shows up again when you find Eve taking a look at the fruit, and she saw, even though it was the forbidden fruit, she saw that it was pleasurable to the eye. And then the next time you find it is in the book of Exodus in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not covet your neighbor's house or your neighbor's wife or your neighbor's things. Why? Because they are pleasurable to the eye. All of us are going to have to deal with stuff that's pleasurable to the eye. Can I get an amen from somebody out here? We're going to have to deal with it because it will distract you from what's really important. It will distract you from your destiny. And when that intense, passionate desire births inside of here, you know the, 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 the sequence in the book of James, LSD, right? Remember the old drug LSD? This is the easy way to remember it, okay? So you guys are saying, Pastor, what are you talking about? LSD, lust. Sin and death. Just that simple. It starts with lust and an intense desire. Then eventually that lust gives, conceives sin and that sin gives birth to 
death in our lives. So we have to be careful about this because covetous greed and desire for things can derail your destiny if we let it. Second Kings, if you will, Second Kings chapter 5. While you're turning there in Second Kings chapter 5, let me tell you this story and catch up to where we're at. In Second Kings chapter number 5, there's a guy by the name of Naaman. Naaman is from Syria, okay? Now, Naaman was a, a commander of the army of the king. He was a mighty man of valor. He was a man of war. And he came from an ungodly nation. Now, Naaman had heard that there was a God in Israel who could heal him because he had leprosy. Skin-eating disease, right? And so here he comes with a letter stating, I want you to talk to your prophet and tell him to heal me. And so he comes with that letter from his king to the king of Israel. And the king of Israel says, oh, that's it. What, what does he want me to do, a miracle? I can't do this. Now, the prophet knows what's up. And so the prophet says, no, send him down to me. It's not a problem. All right? So Naaman comes down to the prophet. The prophet won't even meet with him. He sends his servant Gehazi out to him. And he says, hey, uh, the, the man of God tells you that all you got to do is just go dip in the Jordan River seven times. You'll be cleansed. Now, Naaman gets mad. Okay? Remember, this is a man of war. And he just gets hot, okay? And he starts storming, starts yelling and spitting. I, I could imagine maybe, maybe he said a few of those high school words that we're all trying to forget, right? And so he starts, he just starts spitting out and he says, well, well I thought that he would have came out and maybe he would have waved his hand over the area and, and spoke some words or something, you know, he would have called in the name of his God or well, he would have done something, not just send his servant out and tell me to go dip in the river seven times. Uh, aren't the rivers back home better than this dirty old mud pit river over here? I'm not dipping in that stupid thing and he gets mad now his servants finally talk some sense into him they say if he would have told you some great feat like you know climb up the highest mountain you can find and up there there's eagle eggs and you need to crack them open and drink the the yolk out of them and and, and then you need to cross you know the ocean i mean wouldn't you have done it i mean you're you're a man's man you you would have you would have went out and fought a war if you had to how much more if he says just go dip seven times Right? And so he's like, all right, all right. You guys, you guys are right. You guys are right. Let me just go try it out. Let me see what happens. So he goes down and he dips seven times in the river. Wouldn't you know, God shows up. Seventh time he comes up out of the water and he looks at his skin and there it is soft as a baby's behind. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm saying? And, he, and he's like, wow, he's amazed. Now, Naaman had brought with him a whole lot of gold, a whole lot of silver. He brought clothing. He had brought, uh, you know, all sorts of gifts that he could bring in case they asked him for a gift. In fact, if you calculated up the amount of stuff that Naaman had brought, it would come up to over a million dollars worth of goods. Hello? Million bucks. I'd have been like, just back up the truck, Naaman. Come on, you know, this is all for the glory of God, right? But not Elisha. Elisha says, I don't need nothing. Go home. And he urges him, name and pressures. Come on, take something. This is a gift. Come on. Were you going to rob me of my blessing? How many times have we heard that? You're going to rob me of my blessing, right? Man of God, are you going to rob me of my blessing? Oh, okay, all right, I'll tell you, just give me the clothes, you know, or whatever. No, he says, I'm not taking nothing from you. In other words, naming you can't buy the blessing of God. This is, this is free because there's a greater purpose. You know what happens? Naaman says, now I know that the Lord, he is God. And he says, I'm going to take two cartloads of dirt home with me. I mean, he came with a million bucks worth of stuff left with some dirt, Right? Why? Because he said, this is the place where I met up with God. This is the land when my life was changed. And I want to remember this place. Now, he, he asked the man of God, will you forgive me? Okay, because the, the man of God was the representative of God. He said, will God forgive me? Will he pardon me as I go with my master into the temple of his God? And he kneels down and I kneel with him. Will God forgive me of that? The man of God says, go in peace. Because see, it's not about outward actions bowing while someone else worships what it was about Naaman's heart. Naaman's heart was for the Lord. In fact, Jesus later on talks about him. It's pretty amazing when you think about it. So the man of God says, go in peace. Now, this is where we pick up the story because remember what I, we're talking about tonight is distractions from destiny, how things, covetousness and greed, that intense desire of things that are pleasurable to the eye can actually derail us 
from our destiny. Second Kings chapter number five, we're going to take a look at a couple of verses. Verse number 20, starting out, look at what it says. Verse number 20, but Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, look, my master has spared name in this Syria, while not receiving from his hands what he brought. But as the Lord lives, I will run after him, and look at this, and take something from him. Now, a couple of things I want you to notice. First of all is that Gehazi, in the beginning of the verse, justifies himself. He had seen something that was pleasurable to the eye. I mean, think about it. Millions of dollars worth of stuff was just laid out in front of him and in front of his master. He was probably going, woohoo! finally, serving God all these years and serving under the man of God, it finally has paid off, right? And, and he's thinking, oh, I like that. I'll take two of those. One of, oh, yeah, that's nice right there. I could bring that on. Okay, what, what do you got over there? Yeah, I'll take some of that too, okay? And give some to the man of God while you're at it. He doesn't need much, but, you know, come on. And so when the man of God says, no, I don't want nothing. I'm not going to take any, I'm not going to receive anything from you. You go in peace. He's like, what? Have you seen these shoes, man of God? They're wore out from running after you. Right? So what does he do? He justifies himself. He says, look, my master spared Naaman this Syrian. See, because the Jewish people, they knew their God. Now here's a foreigner coming in and receiving a miracle. And shouldn't he have to pay for that? I mean, the Israelites, they bring their tithes. So why shouldn't he have to give something in order to receive? Why is it free for him? While not receiving from his hands what he brought, he brought it. He wanted to give. I'm doing him a favor, right? He starts to justify himself. And then finally, he reveals the intent of his heart, and he says, as the Lord lives, I will run after him and take something from him. Him. See, now it's no longer about receiving. Now it's about taking. There was a covetous desire on the inside of him. There was a, a greedy heart that said, I'm going to go take what's rightfully mine. See, it started as lust. It bred sin. And now let's take a look at the effects. Drop down to verse number 25. Take a look at what it says. Now, in between verse 20 and 25, Gehazi, first of all, lies to Naaman. He makes up this story, oh, while you were gone, uh, you know, when you were leaving, two of the, the sons of the prophets came to my master, and they don't have any food, they, they need some money, you know, can you just give me some of that? And so he's absolutely, come and get it here, what do you need? Oh, yeah, here you go, you know, and, and so Naaman, having this great heart, just says, yeah, here, I wanted to give, go ahead, and he sends him on his way. So first of all, he's lied to Naaman, right? So now here, he's adding sin on top of sin, started in his heart, now it's gone to his lips. Then it's come to his hands, he's received something that he should not have received, and now he goes before the man of God, he goes and he hides the stuff that he took, the clothing and the silver and the gold, and so what does he do? He goes back to his master like, hey, what's up, you know? What's going on? Nothing happened, what? You know, just kinda, just kinda there. And he lies to Elisha. Now, this is the man of God, okay? This is the one who has performed miracles. This is the one who hears the prophetic voice, right, and speaks those things which he hears. He hears from the Father, and then he speaks prophetically the words of God. And you think you're going to hide that from the man of God. So he comes into his presence thinking everything's cool. He's just lied to Naaman. He's received things that he should not have received, and now he's lied to his master. In verse 25, take a look at what it says. It says, now he went in and stood before his master, Elisha, and said to him, where did you go, Gehazi? And he answered and he said, your servant did not go anywhere. Verse 26, then he, Elisha, said to him, Gehazi, did not my heart go with you when the man turned back from his chariot to meet you? Is it time to receive money and to receive clothing, olive groves and vineyards, sheep and oxen, male and female servants? The answer to that is obviously no. It's not the time. There will be a time, but this is not that time. This man's heart was on the line. It was about him. It was not about us. Look at the next verse. He says, therefore. Ooh, that's quite a word, isn't it? In other words, because this is not the time to receive, because of what I just said, therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. And he went out from his presence, leprous, white as snow. Wow. 
Now, as I read the Bible, I don't find Gehazi with the man of God anymore. I find that the servant of Elisha was around, and maybe that was Gehazi. But could it be that Gehazi left his presence and never came back because of the shame that was in his heart? Derailed from his destiny. You see, Elisha had followed Elijah, the great prophet. He would not get off him. Elijah kept telling him, go back, turn back, stop following me. And he told him, I will not. As surely as the Lord lives, I will go with you. He followed him. He served him. In fact, when Elisha was called, we find him as a businessman. He was plowing fields. He was working hard. And he had 12 yoke of oxen. And when the man of God came and threw his mantle over his shoulders, he stopped, he went, and he made a sacrifice of those oxen, and he burned it on his plowing instruments, the wood. So we see that he left everything to follow the call of God in his life. But here's Gehazi, and he could have been the successor. He could have been the one to take that role as the prophet in Israel. If he would have kept his heart and followed the man of God. But now, instead of being his successor, he leaves his presence. And I don't know that we ever see him again with the man of God. We do see him with the king. There's a time where God uses him once again to do something great and mighty for a woman. There in the Old Testament, you can read about it. But we don't see him taking the place as prophet in Israel. Could it be that that was his destiny and he got derailed because of a heart that went after things? See, if we allow things to become our focus, we will become unfruitful. We cannot allow things to become our focus. You know, and it's hard. I understand this. This is why we preach. This is why we learn the word of God. This is why we come together as a church and we talk about these things. It's because our culture and our society has so conditioned us to desire things. Think about it this way. Every three years, the car manufacturers have figured it out that people get bored with the same looking car. And so they produce a new model every three years. Do you know how long leases are? Every three years, right? Why? Because they know that they can get you going and going and going. It's a money machine. You've got to have the latest model. You've got to have the latest look. You have to be the first to have it. I mean, my goodness, we're on iPhone number six, now S, and, and, and it, it, everything's the same, only everything's new, right? And, and, and there's all sorts of new stuff. Every time you turn around, somebody is sho- shoving something in your face saying it's new, it's sleeker, it's smaller, it's bigger, it's better, it's something, Right? And there's always something that they say, if you get a hold of this thing, your life will be better. If you have this stuff, if you wear these shoes, if you wear this clothing, if you look like this, if you've got this latest and greatest, then your life will be so much better. But I'm here to tell you, church, it won't be. Because if your life isn't good without the stuff, with the stuff, it's going to be the same. Why? Because the, the stuff doesn't change your life. Your life isn't about those things. And if you're not happy without it, you still won't be happy with it. When life becomes about things, we become unfruitful. You remember the parable of the sower? Jesus talked about a sower goes and he sows a seed. And there were four different types of seed that we found. All the same seed, all sown, four different types of ground. I apologize. Four different types of ground that we found. First was the stony ground. The birds came on the road on the wayside, right? And they picked it up. We found out that the devil was those birds, right? He came and he stole away the word before it could take root. Then we found out there was shallow ground, right? And that shallow ground, the the plant sprang up quickly, but because of persecution. For the word's sake, like the rising of the sun, the sun came, the heat scorched it, and the plant didn't bear any fruit. Now, the third type of seed, okay, we'll talk about that one in a second, but there was a fourth type of seed, which was the good ground, which went into the heart, right? And it produced a crop. People heard it, they understood it, they received it, and then it produced a crop. Now, that third type of seed, we know, was the seed that was sown among thorns and thistles, sown among the weeds, basically. And it did grow up into a plant, but those thorns and those thistles, they choked the plant that was growing up. They choked the word that was sown. And Jesus talks about this in the book of Mark chapter 4. If you want to turn there now in the New Testament to Mark chapter number 4. And let's take a look at what he says. He interprets the parable for his disciples. And in Mark chapter number 4, he's talking to them about this parable. He's talking to them about the types of ground where the seed is sown. And take a look at what he says in Mark chapter 4, verse number 18 and verse number 19. 
Mark chapter 4, starting in verse number 18, says this. It says, now these are the ones sown among thorns. So he says, I'm about ready to explain to you what's going on with the thorns. These are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word. Everybody say, hear the word. So the problem is not with the word, right? There's no problem with the word. They hear the word. They're probably folks like you and me sitting in church. Probably folks like you and me that wake up in the morning and read their Bibles. Probably folks that have a good life and good intentions of the heart. They have a heart for the things of God. They hear the word, but take a look at the next verse. Verse number 19. And the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things. Entering in, choke the word, and it becomes, what's that last word there? Oh, come on, what's that last word there? Uh, Everybody, what's that last word there? Unfruitful. That's the opposite of what we want to be. We want to be fruitful, is that right? So the cares come in. Pressures, weights, bills. Look around us and see things going on. I don't understand why this is happening. And what do we often say when the bills are stacking up and and when the kids are saying they they need new clothes and and then you see the commercial or the billboard for Disneyland or you saw somebody's post on social media, they just took another vacation? Really, do they need another vacation, right? Oh, come on, you've said it. Don't look at me like you're so holy. (laughs) I've said it. Come on, come on. Another? What are they doing, right? Really, what's going on is that there's there's a... Desire. Something looked pleasurable to the eye, and we wanted it, but we couldn't have it. And we saw there was a problem. What was the problem? Well, we say the problem was not enough money. Cares are weighing us down. And then there's the deceitfulness of riches that comes in, right? Oh, if only I had more money. Rather than saying, oh, if only I had more of God in my life. If only I had more joy in the fruit of the Spirit being produced. See, vacations and all that stuff are necessary. They're wonderful and they're great. But can I tell you something? I don't need a vacation if I got Jesus. He's my rest. He's my everything. He's my refuge. He's my retreat when I need it. He's the strong tower I can run to and be safe. I can cast my cares on him because he cares for me. And guess what? I can roll it off of my back onto his back because guess what? His back's a whole lot stronger than mine. And so the deceitfulness of riches comes in. We do not need more money. God can work without money. It wasn't money that bought Naaman's healing, was it? I'm sorry, it wasn't Naaman's money that bought healing, was it? No, the answer is no. It wasn't money that bought your salvation, was it? No. See, you were not redeemed with silver and gold, but with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, it's not about money. But then the desires of other people things enters in. See, we get distracted. We get off of our focus. We get off of the word of God. We get off of our calling. We get off of our destiny. We, we get off of things. You know, uh, some of us, when we got saved, man, we were telling everybody about Jesus. Could not shut us up, but then cares, deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire for other things. Well, so-and-so's over there, and they're ministering. Why don't I minister? Why don't I have a title? Why don't I have a position? Well, do they not recognize me and Don't they love me? Listen, there's room for everybody. There is a place. God has a position. God has a title. And if no one knows it on the earth, that's okay. It's good preaching. I'll tell you right. Amen, preacher. Go ahead. Because that's not what this is about. Listen, church, we can't allow ourselves to get distracted. Why? Because it will become unfruitful. See, if we just put our head down and get to work, you know, I like what Martin Luther King Jr. said. He said, if a man is a street sweeper, let him do that to the glory of God. See, it doesn't matter who knows you here on the earth. It doesn't matter who knows your name, your title, your position. It doesn't matter if you have a business card that says, Minister so-and-so. Listen, when you get to heaven, you're not going to be reaching for your card to introduce yourself to God. He knows your name. Hello? God is not looking for that. He's not looking for a name badge. He's not looking for a placard. He's not looking for trophies. Because the only crown you're going to have in heaven is what did you do in the service of the king? That gold, that silver, and that precious stone, your faith, the Bible says is like gold. The words that we speak are like 
apples of gold and settings of silver. And the tongue of the righteous is like choice silver. And those precious stones, you know what that is? People. Didn't the apostle Paul say, you are our jewel. You are our crown of glory. See, people, we need to gather as many as we can. Each and every one of us is a full-time minister of God. We can't get distracted with other things and, and stuff and amassing wealth and, oh, so-and-so has this and they got a new car and I wish I could. Listen, let's get off that stuff. And let's just follow what God has called us to do. Is that okay? All right. How do I combat covetousness, greed, and desire for things? We've got we to find that out. How, how do I combat that then? If this stuff's coming against me, if it's a distraction, how do I stay focused and combat covetousness, greed, and the desire for things? First of all is this, is find your life in Christ. Because if you're finding your life in things, you're finding it in the wrong place. It's not going to happen. You're there in the, the book of Mark. Turn me this time to the book of Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. I'm going to read a lot of scripture. I'm going to let you know that right now, okay? But Jesus is talking. And, and I just love the words of Jesus. Luke chapter 12. And Jesus has something to say about this. Luke chapter number 12. And I, and I love the way that this, this whole thing kind of plays out. I love how it starts off. Because this is the life of a pastor right here, okay? I'm going to let you into my life. I'll let you into the life of a pastor for a second. Here we go. Luke chapter 12, starting in verse number 13. Okay, we're talking about finding our life in Christ. Because our life is not about things, our life is not about uh, the cares, our life is not about wealth, riches, or money, or how much stuff we can gather up. We find our life in Christ. Luke chapter 12, starting in verse number 13, look at what it says. It says, then one from the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. I can't tell you how many times I've had people come to me and say, pastor, you need to talk some sense into my wife. Pastor. I need you to come over to my house and slap my kids into submission. <laughs> Pastor, I got in business with this guy. Can you tell him to treat me right? Look at the response of Jesus, and I won't say anything about my responses to those people, but I want you to just listen to verse number 14. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? I love that. Jesus says, I ain't doing it. Not going to get involved. That's not what I'm here to do. Now look at verse number 15. And he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life, what are we talking about? Finding our life, right? Not finding our life in stuff. Not finding our life in things. Finding our life in Christ. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. See, the world has this theory, he who dies with the most toys wins, right? But I like the other bumper sticker I saw one time that said, he who dies with the most toys still dies. It's true. What's the, what's the saying? Get all you can, put it all in a can, and sit on the can until you kick the can. Anybody heard that one? That's foolish. See, this is not about the stuff we possess. You are no more or no less of a person because of what you have or what you don't have. Come on, somebody. Amen. Amen. Verse 16, then he spoke a parable. This is a story. This is a, a, a story that he tells, that he throws alongside what he said that to, to emanate or to... Uh, amplify the truth that he's been just talking about. So he says, your life is not in the amount of possessions you have. Not about what you have, not about what you don't have, okay? And so he tells him this story. The ground of a certain rich man, now notice the guy's already rich, okay? The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. So Bill Gates made some more money right now. Everybody got the picture? Okay. Now we always scratch our heads and say, why, why, you know? And, and we lament, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Maybe we should take all the money of the rich and we should distribute it to everybody else. Maybe we should, uh, you know, tax the rich more because they make more. Maybe we should do so. Listen, there's a spiritual principle here and it's not about stuff. It's not about amounts, okay? You guys following? We're talking about finding our life in Christ. So when we see the wealthy get wealthier, my heart is not moved. 
doesn't matter. Let them. Especially if they don't have God. They should enjoy their time here because their eternity is not looking very good. Hello? And somebody needs to tell them about Jesus. Whether they have or don't have, it doesn't matter. So he says, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought with him himself, saying, what shall I do? Since I have no room to store my crops. In other words, the bank has busted. Right? And they can't even handle all the wealth that I've got. Verse number 18. So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And and I love this next verse. This verse is hilarious, all right? And I will say to my soul, soul? Anybody talk to yourself like that? Come on, be honest. Okay, thank you. Thank you for those five or six honest people. Rest of y'all, I know better. And I will say to my soul, soul? You have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. You know, in the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon talked about that, right? He said, if, if, if we don't have anything going on in the future, might as well eat, drink, and be merry, right? For tomorrow we die. Here Jesus repeats that. And he says, this rich man will build bigger barns. He's provided for himself for many years, and he'll just kick back and enjoy the ride, and he will eat, drink, and be merry. He'll live off that wealth for the rest of his days. Verse number 20, but God said to him, didn't call himself, did he? Didn't say soul. What did he call him? Fool. Fool. This night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? In other words, you're not going to enjoy that for many years. So all this stuff you have, where's it going, fool? (laughs) Heard about the guy that got buried in his Cadillac? Heard about the people that made sure to put in their will that they keep their gold teeth in their mouth when they leave? Why? Seriously, why? Why? Wanting to be buried with their favorite toys and their favorite possessions. Why? Put a perfectly good Cadillac in the ground. Somebody could have been driving that right now. (laughs) Verse 21, so is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Verse 22, then he said to his disciples, therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about the body, what you will put on. Aren't we always worried about what we're going to eat? Right? Got all these commercials about where we're going to eat. Got to make the right choice. Got to eat fresh. Got to make the healthy choice. Got to make the smart choice. Got to make the big choice. Got to make the little choice. Got to make the fast choice. Right? We're always worried about those things and what we will put on. People are buying magazines, going, there's blogs about what to wear and how to wear it and all that kind of stuff. Now, that's okay. That's all right if you're into that. But listen, don't let that control you. Don't let that be the guiding factor of your life. Life is not about things. It's a distraction. Look at what he says, verse 23. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? Met up with a homeless guy in, uh, in Santa Ana. We were um, taking the youth. Uh, guy has been a long time ago now. But um, we, we took the youth out on a trip to the Dream Center. And we exposed them to what was going on just down there in L.A. Saw some amazing things take place. Lots of things happening. And while we were there, I ran into a homeless guy. And he said, you know what? The Lord has never let me miss a meal. I, I, and he held his belly and was like, I actually need to probably lose some of this, except that I'm homeless and I'm afraid to, you know? And, and, and yet he said I, he's never missed a meal, never had to worry one minute because God had been so good to him. Didn't have a job, didn't have any money, didn't have nothing. See, how much more value are you than the birds? God will take care of you. You don't have to miss anything. You don't have to worry about that. Verse 25, and which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? A cubit was about uh, the, the length of your arm. Can you... If you worry, can you grow taller, right? It doesn't work, does it? No matter how much you squint your eyes, you could jump up and down, you could hang upside down in your closet for months, and you would never be able to add that much length to your body. Is that right? So he says, which of you by worrying can add anything to your life? 
Verse 26, if you then are not able to do the least, notice he calls it the least. To us, that's like a big deal, right? Wait, are you saying growing this tall, that's, that's not a big deal, God? No, God speaks and planets exist. He says the word and light stretches across the expanse of the universe. Jesus can speak a word and the dead are raised again to life. Arms that have been withered and torn and women who have been bent over for decades. All he has to do is speak a word and they're immediately straightened out and healed, raised from the dead. So he says, that's, the le- that's, that's little stuff. That's peddly stuff. So if you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Clothing, food, where you're going to live, the stuff, the status quo, the Joneses. Got to keep up with the Joneses. Listen, nobody can keep up with the Joneses. They're constantly moving. You might as well find something you like and plant yourself there because in about 10 years, the style is going to come back around again. You know what I'm saying? Heard one of the ladies here on staff one time, she said, oh, clue up, pants are back in style. Hallelujah, I'll go get them out of the, the storage closet. It was like, hey, you know, she had a whole new wardrobe that was in style all over again. I just saw bell bottoms at this store the other day. I was like, oh, no, you didn't. But yes, they did. <laughs> Verse 27, consider the lilies. This is still Jesus speaking, by the way. Consider the lilies. How they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Remember, Solomon had all the wealth you could imagine. Solomon had stuff coming in by the boatload. Solomon was so wealthy, no other king. He had so much silver that people treated it like it was just gravel on the ground. Oh, it's silver? No, I don't need none of that. Got enough of that. We used it to, you know, put, put in the kids' play area. That was, that was, that's how common it was. They didn't, they didn't care about it. So even Solomon wasn't arrayed like one of these. Verse 28, if then God so clothes the grass which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? Verse 29, and do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. Don't worry about it, guys. Don't worry about it. Verse 30, for all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your father knows that you need these things. Now, did you hear that? Your father knows that you need these things. Let's try that again. Your father knows that you need these things. Okay? So he didn't say throw them out. He didn't say run naked around. You know, none of that. Okay? Please, none of that. He didn't say you don't eat. You know, you just go on hunger strike until you die. He said your father knows that you need to eat and drink to live. He also knows that you need to wear clothes. Maybe you've been worried about, man, my clothes are falling apart and I, I gotta dress nice for the job. God knows. Ask him. God, these clothes are falling apart. I need new clothes. I need business clothes, God. Kids are growing too fast, outgrowing stuff, or maybe your kids are hard on their clothes like mine are. Oh my goodness, I pu- pulled the shoes out from last year and went, really? You know, like, what were you doing? It's crazy. God knows. God knows your kids need new shoes. God knows that your family needs stuff. And listen, if you just literally don't have it, come to the church and ask about our resource center because we do have something to help you, okay? That's where I just dumped off all of my stuff. So you could be styling like Pastor Dan, okay? Come on, somebody. (laughs) Pastor Dan had been wearing this shirt in a year, right? There's no shame in that. Listen, because God knows you have need of it, and God wants to provide for your natural needs, God will take care of you. If he can clothe the flowers of the field in such beauty that will make you cry, how much more can he put shoes on your feet, clothes on your body, take care of your family, put food on your table, and pay your bills? You don't have to worry. You don't have to be anxious. You don't have to wonder. Your father knows. Look at verse 31. But seek the kingdom of God. In the book of Matthew, it says, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things and all these What? And all these, what? Things shall be added to you. Don't get distracted by things. It's okay to have things, but it's not okay for things to have you. Verse 32, do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That's quite a statement. Because he didn't just say the things. Right? The things will be added to you, but then God will give you the kingdom. You know what the kingdom is? 
It's all the resource. It's all the land. It's all the fields. It's all the vineyards. It's all the olive trees. It's all the clothing. It's all the buildings. It's all the wealth. It's the castle. It's the throne. God has given it all to us, his church. And it's his good pleasure. God smiles when he pours out blessings and abundance on us. But he knows that if things have us, it'll distract us from destiny. That's why sometimes God says, I'm not going to prosper you yet. Because I'm waiting for your heart to develop to the point where you can handle the blessing. More people, more people can handle failures and lack than can handle success and blessing. Because the heart gets so attached to things. If we can unattach and if we can get ourselves to a place where we're seeking first the kingdom of God, then watch, the blessings will overtake you. All those things will be added to you. My goodness, you don't have to worry about stuff. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Verse 33, sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. Verse 34, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. See, if your heart is in Christ, remember Jesus is seated at the right hand of God presently. The Bible says that we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Therefore, we set our minds on things above. For we died and our life is now hidden with Christ in God. That's the book of Colossians chapter 3. And so if we have a heavenly mentality, then we're not going to care about what is provided here on the earth. We're going to provide about providing something that's eternal in the heavens. See, it's like a savings account for retirement, right? If I know that I've got until I'm age, let's say 70, that I'm going to retire and I put money into a retirement account that I cannot touch until I am 70 years old, then if I want to live a great life from 70 on, I'm going to put money into that account. Is that right? And I'm going to keep adding to that. I'm going to watch it mature. I'm going to watch it grow. I'm going to watch how the market goes up, and I'm going to pray when it dips, right? Hallelujah, Lord, you got to come through. And so... I'm going to keep putting into that. Why? Because when I'm 70, I'm going to have a wonderful life that I can continue to live a certain type of lifestyle because I poured into that retirement account. No different with heaven. When you start to pour your faith, that gold, when you speak those words of choice silver, and when you bring precious stones in, right, that is added to your account in heaven. So when you get to heaven, and the fire of God hits your life. It burns up the wood, hay, and straw, the stubble, the stuff that didn't matter. But guess what comes shining forth? An amazing, wonderful thing that you have built on the foundation of Jesus Christ that is eternal in the heavens, and your reward will be great. Can you say amen? amen. Last thing for tonight. Last thing for tonight. See, this is a heart matter. Who do I love? What's most important? And where am I looking for fulfillment? Who do I love? If I say I love the Lord, then man, what's important? What's important is not now. What's important is eternity. And where am I looking for fulfillment? Am I finding my fulfillment in things or am I finding my fulfillment in Christ? Because if you're finding your fulfillment in things, it's going to be the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And eventually hoarders will be coming to your house to film an episode of your life. None of us want that. So how do I combat covetousness, greed, and desire for things? First of all, is that you have to find your life in Christ. Last one is this, develop a generous life. You know that people that have fears oftentimes confront their fears. And, and, and as they do, they find out, man, that's not so bad. And so they overcome their fears. Pastor Luke has shared about his fear of heights and how going mountain climbing, and now he's to the point where he's walking up or crawling up to the edge, looking over, you know, 14,000 foot drops, all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, you know, he's been up to Mount Whitney, the, the highest peak in the continental uh, United States, that sort of a thing. And each and every one of us, we need to face our fear of lack, face our fear of of being generous because oftentimes there's something that comes where we say if I have a thing and, and, and if I give it away then I won't have it well the question's to be begged so what so you don't have it well will my life be less if I don't have it or, or will I will I have needed it what if I needed that thing and, and then I gave it to somebody else and then I needed it well wait a second your father knows you have need of these things right and it's his good pleasure to give you the kingdom so if you gave it away and God knew that you needed it don't you think he can get you a new one See, my wife and I, we have really endeavored to be a people that have been generous, and we have been privileged over the year to give away cars, 
That's been one of my greatest joys was seeing the face on somebody when I told them we're giving you a car. Remember one lady, we told her that in the, in the middle of a, a big box grocery store, right? And she said, praise God. Like, and it just boomed throughout the whole store. Everybody, all the cashiers were like, you know, it was awesome. Last guy, I gave it to, man, he was so excited, so happy. I was trying to be sneaky, but my name was on the pink slip, you know what I'm saying? And he came back later and was like, I just want to thank you, you know? What a blessing in my life. My goodness, as I was bagging up those clothes, uh, you know, I, I, I almost get sad when we have to throw stuff away because it's been used or damaged or anything like that because I get a joy in being generous. That happens because we develop a generous heart. It doesn't happen overnight. I did not start that way, by the way. I started like this, mine. Don't touch, right? It's all in the can, and I'm going to sit on the can. That's how I was, all right? But I had to, over the years, develop a generous heart and get around generous people like Pastor Jim and Deborah, who just have blown my mind with their generosity. I mean, I remember the day that Pastor Jim stood in front of his church and said, I will not pastor a church that's not generous, after he had heard about what was going on in Africa with the widows and the orphans. And he said, I'm selling my boat. Oh, my goodness. That was a boat that was given to him. That was a gift. That was a major story in his life. That was a major moment. And yet, he wasn't going to hold on to it. And he sowed that gift and sowed that seed. And this church followed him in generosity. Church, I think we need to start developing that heart again. That we need to look for that. We have opportunities at the end of the year, Thanksgiving. We have Christmas at the Rock. There are ways to get involved. And it's time for us to not hold on to what we have and say, no, I need it, it's mine, don't touch, don't look, don't, don't even smell, get out of here with that nose, right? And we gotta stop that. And we've gotta allow ourselves to be generous. God is a giver. Oh, I should have had more than two amens. God is a giver. For God so loved the world, his motivation was love. He so loved the world that he did what? Gave, gave who? Jesus, he gave his son. I mean, think about that for a second. He didn't even withhold the most precious thing to him, his son. God in the flesh. You know, Jesus was a giver, right? Freely, you ever see freely give? Jesus sent people out. Jesus gave. Jesus, when it was time to feed people, he was happy. He was excited. Fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. Jesus was a giver. And he did it more than once. When it came time to pay taxes, he told Peter, go fishing. He found the coin. Hey, pay your taxes and mine. Jesus was a giver. Jesus healed the sick, cleansed the lepers, raised the dead. Jesus was giving stuff left and right. Jesus was a giver. You know the Holy Spirit's a giver? Did you know that? The Bible says that he will teach you. He's always given us wisdom. It says he will lead us. He's given us direction. It says that when we're hurting and when we're in pain or when we, when we need the comfort, he is our comforter. He gives us comfort. He gives us peace. He gives us wisdom and understanding. He comforts us and settles us down and says, child, it's going to be all right. The Holy Spirit's a giver. See, it's in the nature of God to give. And church, you have the Spirit of God living on the inside of you. You know what that means? It means you're a giver. You were made for it. You weren't made to hoard and store up. You weren't made to cling to things. You were made to be generous. Last verse, I'll put it up on the overheads. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 24 and 25 in the message. I love how it says this. It says, the world of the generous gets larger and larger. How many of you want to live in a large world? How many live in an expansive place? That's where you want to be. My goodness, the world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. You know why? Because the stuff keeps creeping in all around them. Verse 25, the one who blesses others is abundantly blessed. Those who help others are helped. See, when you give, the Bible says what you sow, you will also reap. So when you help others, when you give, you know what? I have tried to out give God. It's a fun game. You should try it sometime. I have tried to out bless. I have tried to out love. I have tried to out sow, but it never works. God is more generous and God loves that game too. And he plays unfair because he's God. He just always is blessing me too much. He's always given too much. He's always loving too much. He's always doing way more than I am able to do. But that's the fun of the game. Because you know it's a losing battle. But, oh my goodness, when you get in competition with God, God rolls up his sleeves and says, all right, let's go. You want, you want some of this? I got you. All right? The world of the generous gets larger and larger, but the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. See, if you want to confront that fear, just start giving away. See if it works. 
Test them, God said. Test me. Go ahead. Bring your tithe, bring your offering. See what happens. Give and it shall be given. Cast your bread on the waters and it shall return to you after many days. See, there are principles in the word of God. They cannot be reversed. God has to make them happen. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. You don't have to fear lack. You don't have to fear not having. God knows you have need of the things and he will provide them for you as you seek first his kingdom. What did we learn today? Well, we learned that there are distractions from our destinies. Part number three, this is things. Covetousness, greed, and desire for things can derail your destiny if you let it. If we allow things to become our focus, we will become unfruitful. So how do I combat it? Well, first of all, find your life in Christ. And second of all, develop a generous heart. Did you guys get something from the word tonight? Come on, give God a great big praise. Hallelujah. I want to talk to you guys before you leave this place. You guys were awesome. Appreciate you guys staying put. I want to make sure before you leave this place that your heart's right with God and that if you left here tonight and you died by no fault of your own, and God forbid that should happen. Isn't that terrible sounding, you know? You died, right? Everybody all of a sudden goes, whoa, pastor just got real serious on us. But you know what? It is a serious matter because what if? We're not promised tomorrow. Remember the rich man in the parable Jesus gave, right? Here he is. He's finally taking his ease. He's finally kicking back and enjoying life. And God says, you fool. What are you going to do with all that stuff now that you're dead and now that you're gone? Who, who's going to have it now? And he didn't take care of what was important, which was eternity. And tonight, I don't want you to be a fool. I want you to be wise. The Bible says that we should search for the wisdom of God, that we can be wise for salvation. And so tonight, let me give you the wisdom of God on this, okay? Because you're not going to get to heaven just because you entered a church. Not going to get to heaven just because you sat in a seat in a sanctuary and warmed up a spot. It doesn't work like that. There's going to be a lot of people who attended church who aren't going to make it to heaven. And tonight, I love you enough to tell you the truth, respect you enough and honor you enough not to play games. Because I want to make sure that you go to heaven, that you're wise for salvation and not a fool who ends up in hell forever and ever. Sometimes people think that if they can be good enough that they'll work their way into heaven. So you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say you can be good enough to work your way into heaven? Because our works compared to God's goodness are like filthy rags. It's going to get thrown out. We can never be good enough. Sometimes people think if they can attend enough church or if they can volunteer enough or help out enough or maybe if they were raised in church or parents told them they were Christians growing up, that that makes them right with God. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible, check it out, nowhere does it say that because you were raised in church or your parents told you you're a Christian because you're born in America, drive a Chevrolet and eat apple pie, that you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can attend enough church or volunteer enough or help out enough to get you into heaven. That's just like good works, isn't it? Sometimes people think if they know enough scripture, they can quote enough or they can sing enough or, or maybe if they, they know enough about God that that gets them to heaven. But did you know that demons know who Jesus is? They know about God. They know who Jesus is. And they tremble. The devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures out of his mouth. And in fact, I would venture to tell you that the devil knows more scripture than we do. Been around a lot longer than we have. You find him quoting scripture in the Bible, and yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven, even though he knows who Jesus is. Come on. Let's talk about your life. You're not going to make it. If that's how you think you're going to get to heaven. This is not about what you have in your head, not about having mental ascent towards God, knowing who Jesus is, but rather this is about your heart. God's always been after your heart. The way to get to heaven is by being what Jesus called born again. It's in all of your heart and all of your life experience. Not what Hollywood and movies and television and books and the internet tell you. They'll tell you it's some weirdo crazy thing trying to get you off of that. But that's a lie trying to get you distracted from destiny. If you've given God all of your heart, you've given God all of your life and welcomed him in, then now God recreates you from the inside. You're born again. And now you live a life that's pleasing to him, learning how to do this. That's why we do the good things. That's why we go to church, all that kind of stuff. See, it flips the script, doesn't it? God comes in and works his way from the inside out. And if you know tonight, as I've been describing this, that you've been doing this backwards, trying to get to heaven on your own good works, or maybe you thought that because you knew some scriptures or you knew about God, 
Maybe you've never known God. Maybe you've never been introduced to this, and this is your first time coming to church, and this is all new to you. Hey, it doesn't matter, because you know it's the truth. God is speaking to your heart right now. The Holy Spirit's tugging at your heartstrings. And tonight, I want to give you an opportunity to choose the right path, to be wise in your decision and not be a fool. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, and then when I say three, I'm going to pop my hands together. Bang! Just like that. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang! That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to take hold of this opportunity. I want to be wise. I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. Be born again, headed for heaven, and denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You might be thinking, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Yeah, you might be. But let's get over that because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one make that trade. Come on. Probably won't even be embarrassed. But even if you are, it's better than ending up in hell, separated from God forever and ever. Who should raise their hand a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, tonight is your night. Make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, given them all of your heart and all of your life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand if, if you're lukewarm? You say, lukewarm, what's that? Well, it's a little in, little out, little up, little down, little token prayer every now and again, and occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, not going to make it. How do I know that? Because in the book of Revelation, last book of the Bible, Jesus is speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. He says, when I come, I want to find you hot, or I want to find you cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. That means that lukewarm Christianity is not real Christianity at all. And if that's your life, come on, you need to go all out for Jesus tonight. Get ready to get your hand up. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching by television in the foyer or down at the Love Rock Cafe. If you're online, hey, get ready to get your hand up. God sees and God's watching. Then right afterwards, you can uh, minimize your browser screen, click the button that says respond to God, or go to our homepage, rockchurch.com, and click the button that says how to know God, and someone will lead you in a prayer. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Let's be wise for salvation together. If that's you, get ready. Here we go. One two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high if that's you. Need to give God all of your heart. Need to give God all of your life. Just raise it up high for me right now. Thank you. There's one. There's two. God bless you guys. Who else tonight? Need to give God all of your heart. Need to give God all of your life. Come on, just raise it up high when I'm looking in your direction. Anybody else real quick? I got you guys. You can put your hands down. There's two, three. Got you over there. Thank you. God bless you. Who else? Who else tonight? You're saying, man, I, I wonder if I should do this. Yeah, you should go for it. If you just ask yourself that question, God's calling you out right now. He just read your mail. Come on, let's go for God tonight, if that's you. Anybody else real quick? Come on, I know there's more than three. Come on, just get your hand up high for me, if that's you, right now when I'm looking in your direction. Who else tonight? Need to give God all of your heart, need to give God all of your life. Anybody else? Come on, the preacher preached way too long, and I need you to hurry it, okay? So come on, just go for it, if that's you. Can I urge you that way? Anybody else real quick? If your heart's thumping out of your chest right now, it could be a good indication that the Spirit's saying, come on, tugging at you. Let's go. Anybody else? I'm wrap. Thank you. Number four, God bless you. Who else? Who else? Number five, you're sitting there and you're saying, man, I wish this guy would shut up. You, need, you really need to get saved. Can I just tell you? Anybody else? Okay. Okay. Maybe you weren't thinking that, but you still need to do it and you know it. Anybody else? Last call. Thank you. Five. Thank you. Six. Okay. Anybody else? Right there. Oh, gotcha. Thank you, seven. Man, that's awesome. Anybody else real quick? Yeah, everybody raise their hand on this side. Over here. I keep coming back to you guys because I know there's somebody over there. You're sitting there hoping and hiding. Come on, you've been hiding for too long. Let the light of God shine on you right now. If that's you, anybody else real quick? I'm going to wrap this thing up. Don't miss this opportunity. Anybody? Thank you. God bless you over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, will you guys give me three more minutes to bring people up? Can we do that tonight? Will you guys, please forgive me. I preached so long. You guys were just too fun tonight. So uh, it's all your fault that I did it. But, but anyways, I love you guys anyways, all right? So if you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, get your stuff, coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Once you get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight. So if that's you, you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand. You come right now. Come on down. Come on down. Come on down. Let's give them a hand as they come. Come on. 
You can come too. From the family rooms, if you need to bring your children down, they'll remember this. Come on down right now. They're coming. They're coming. Come on, you can come too. Anybody else? All right, all right. Hey, come on up, come on up, come on up. Come on up. While I'm speaking, if you need to come and you know you need to come, it's still not too late. Just run down here right now. Hey, you guys up front, look up here. Put a big smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing, okay? Came to give God all your heart. Came to give God all of your life. That's the best decision of your life right now, okay? I want to encourage you guys. You should be happy about that. Right over here to my right, your left. This is Pastor Joel. Really good guy. Nothing weird is going to go on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? I'm about as weird as you're going to encounter tonight. He's cool. He's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus in your heart, give you some free information, some free literature to find out what to do next in your walk with God, and then introduce you to a program we have here called Spiritual Personal Trainers. It's a friend in church who will help you get strong in the ways of the Lord. He'll describe how it works, and then I'll let you come right back out, okay? No weird stuff, all right? You don't have to be afraid. He's cool, okay? So if you guys would make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right this way. Come on, let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.